So the idea is when you want to have a high tunnel in North Carolina, you know that there's going to be the occasional day when it gets down to, you know, the low that I've ever seen here over the 20 years I've been here, it's about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can get below 20. And if you want to have year-round crops, even if they're, um, you know, brassicas, you know, I mean, they can make it through that temporarily, but everything slows down huge. And anything more than, than just growing Brussels sprouts and kale, and you can't do it. So I knew that I wanted a high tunnel that was going to be able to keep things warm. So you need to insulate it with plastic, and that's fine. And that might keep it warm most of the time, but not necessarily all the time. And it will certainly, everything will slow down. When plants are growing, if, it's the, if the average temperature is, let's say, 70 degrees, and it goes up to like 80 degrees average temperature, the plants grow twice as fast. I don't know if that's exactly the numbers, but down to 60 degrees, it's half as fast, and 50 degrees, it's half as fast again, 40 degrees, half as fast again. It's not linear, but, uh, or it's not even linear exponential. But the point is, is that when you start getting down into the 40 degree average day, plants are barely growing. So we want the interior temperature over the winter time to be inside here, be more like the average on the 60s or even up to the 70s if you can. And then we can have a flourishing uh, greenhouse over the winter. It'll allow us, we have a bench on, on the inside of the greenhouse, four feet coming off this wall the whole distance. So we have all that space for growing uh, transplants and nursery operations. So we can start our tomato uh, baby plants in here in January, you know, if we wanted to. And we can even start stuff in the ground. We can have early peas in the ground by like, uh, you know, the first week of February. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do in here. A greenhouse is typically a building like this where everything happens in buckets on benches, the whole place. A high tunnel is structurally very, very similar, but you're growing directly in the dirt on the ground. So our first order of business after we get the high tunnel in is to plant cover crop. Put in biochar, plant cover crop, and start building soil in here. But I also had this idea that it'd be fun to have, you know, a, a lemon tree, <laughs> you know, or, you know, some, some tropicals, you know, is that possible? And so along this wall here, the south wall over here, instead of having, well, there's room for six planting rows in here with my typical spacing. But over here, I was gonna have one more row against the wall. And I decided instead of making this a row because of these pipes that I'll describe to you, breaking it up, I'll just call this row three different sections, down there, down there, and in the middle. And there's just enough space down here for three citrus trees. And same on that side. So I have six citrus, citrus trees. That's called grapefruit, kumquat, tangerine, orange, lemon, and lime. So I'm going to plant six fruit trees there. But then I have this space in between here. And I thought, well, I can plant actually about 60 pineapples here. And I can have this row of pineapples and, uh, and citrus. And now I'm thinking about a, a few less pineapples. And right over here, planting an avocado tree. They, there's a dwarf avocado tree. And I can have two avocado trees here, too. So anyway, that's kind of my plan here. But how are we going to heat it? And so most people, when they approach heating it, they're approaching it from a fully uh, um, capitalist, commercial standpoint of, you know, what's the cost for the installation? What's the cost for getting the temperature here or there? What are your ideal goals? All that stuff. And you can look at all the different technologies. And most people um, uh, heat greenhouses with propane. So they have propane heaters. They have to have underground propane tanks. They have to coordinate delivery and all of that stuff. But you know, you run out of propane, boom, you're dead. You know, you don't have any, uh, you know, heat. Uh, additionally, I thought about, well, I could take the waste heat off the biochar kiln and kind of route it in pipes going underneath the ground. And so I had that idea for a while. But then you got to be making biochar, you know, every day of the winter. Um, so I thought about different things. Then I read about this thing called a climate battery. And that in intrigued me. And so the idea of a climate battery is we have a space here of dirt that's 96 feet by 36 feet. And so imagine if underground, if you start going down, we know the temperature underground is always going to be 54 degrees or 3 or 5 or whatever the number is. It's always 50-something degrees down there once you get down you know, a foot or however far you have to go down to get that, that balance. So since that temperature is always stable, if somehow I could bring that temperature up to the air, then and, 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 and included in the whole air in here, then at least the air wouldn't be below 55 either. And so it is true that it's radiating heat up. But, but uh, what a climate battery is says, let's go a step further. Let's, during the day, harvest heat from the southern sun here and deposit that heat into the soil under my greenhouse. 
during the day because there's a lot of radiant sun heat coming in all day long. And if we can turn the air temper the soil temperature underneath here, you know, up four, five, six, eight degrees during the day, then we can withdraw that extra warmth overnight and really keep the temperature in here where we want it uh, uh, for an average all night long. And so that's the idea. And so what we did is we dug a hole 10 feet deep. And we put in these riser pipes. Actually, it was eight feet deep originally. And the riser pipe is 10 feet, so it comes out of the ground. And we drilled holes. So this is, uh, is an exhaust exit pipe, riser pipe. And we have two input riser pipes that connect to this exhaust riser pipe. And at eight feet down, we ran a lattice of pipes glued at eight feet down underground, four inch pipes with slits in them, uh, at, at, like drain pipes. And we connected seven pipes from that pipe to this one, seven pipes from that one to this one, and then we made it like a radiator and fanned them out so that the entire level, eight foot underground, has a series of pipes going from that riser, input riser, to this exit riser. There's two input risers and only one exhaust riser. And so when you put a fan blowing air down, it pressurizes the whole system because there's double the input versus the, the exhaust. And so that means that all that pressure on all those pipes is permeating and radiating out into the soil at eight feet down. Then we filled in some dirt and did the same thing at six feet down and at four feet down and at two feet down. And so when you look inside this uh, pipe here, we can see that we have 14 pipes uh, attached here from over there and over there at each of the levels, two feet, four feet, six feet, and eight feet underground. The two feet underground ones are far enough down that we'll never bother them when we're planting in the greenhouse because uh, you typically never go down more than about 18 inches even if you're doing a, a deep dig. So this is called an air to soil geothermal system uh, or a friendly name is a climate battery. So you charge the battery every day and you uh, drain or withdraw the battery every night. And so uh, you get to heat this entire system simply for the cost of a fan the electricity to run uh, the four uh, uh, driving fans on the input. Now, that tells part of the story. The other part of the story is you had to excavate a hole nine and a half feet deep is what we wound up doing, 100 feet by 36 feet, and that takes a really long time. And then you have to move the dirt someplace so you can do all this work, and then you have to figure out how to get the dirt back in without crushing the pipes and build this whole thing. So it's a one-time expense, both learning expense and materials and time and, and everything, and it was a ton of fun. Uh, but it is pretty expensive. But then uh, the act of heating it for the next 50 years is just some fans. Um, so that's the climate battery. As far as withdrawing the heat, how does that, how does that go? Is it just natural or? Uh, when I blow, over at nighttime, let's say the outside temperature at night got down to 20 degrees or 15 degrees. Well, there's a certain amount of insulation protection on the uh, double plastic wall on the outside. But the dirt and the temperature in here, we don't want to get down to anything like 20, let alone even getting down to, you know, 60 if we can avoid it. So we'll see how the whole system works when we tune it. But that means that at night when you're blowing air temperature, whatever the air temperature is inside the greenhouse at night, you're blowing it down and you're withdrawing air that is at the 60, 65 degree temperature that you've charged all day long. So you're constantly bringing 65 degree air into the um, uh, channel and you're slowly cooling down the soil underground. Uh, and so that's uh, the soil is a, is a perfect sink to hold the heat. And uh, to get the soil, to get the heat into the soil requires us to have installed all of these pipes. That's the expensive part, is installing all of the pipes and the materials, you know. Um, but now, but it's, kind of, it's a really good experiment. We'll be able to, uh, Max will have it on, um, you know, a, a Raspberry Pi system with temperature monitors and speed of fans. And, and so we'll be able to have charts of the exhaust temperature and the input temperature, you know, uh, every night so we can see what can we learn about this. Do we need our fans to be going faster? Do they need to go slower? What if we put an exhaust fan pulling air up as well as pushing it down? Uh, what are all the factors? So it becomes kind of a, an interesting uh, physics and geometry uh, science project. Uh, we'll also want to be able to manage inside here uh, water. Um, there is something definitively different between rainwater and the water that we irrigate with. So here in the sand hills, the water that comes up from 200 feet underground, the aquifer that's under uh, Aberdeen here, um, is magnificently clean water. 
I mean really pristine, but its pH is about 5.1. And so it's very acidic water. And so if all that I can do is irrigate, and let's say there's no rain for a long time, then I'm adding 5.1 pH water with the cold characteristics of, of way down underground and the mineral makeup of everything down underground and whatever that underground energy is. That's what's going into water all the plants. It's kind of a natural, you know, it's kind of like taking a mountain, st mountain stream and routing it into your fields, you know. Um, Rainwater, on the other hand, came from the clouds and is energetically going through the entire atmosphere, absorbing everything to do with the air. So I believe, I think of it as being like hypernitrogenated air, uh, water that's coming down. It tends to be at a very uh, a basic uh, pH level, and it's coming down to the ground. The problem is, is that it sometimes comes down to the ground so pummeling that it, de that it destroys all the plants. It's like, blah, or a flood and stuff. So rainwater is much better for growing plants, but it's, it's unmanageable, you know, because uh, if, if it's just not enough, that's a problem. And if it's way too much or way too much all at once, it's a real problem. So the challenge of being a farmer, of which there are many, is about finding the right way to care for plants and also respect uh, the variability of nature and the unpredictability of nature. And so that's why a high tunnel seems like a, a good idea, because it's got a roof. So I can now manage the amount of water. But the only water I have is the well, is the water, well water. And so what we want to do is collect all the rain that hits the roof, will come down the sides of the high tunnel into gutters, and then go down into a, 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 an irrigation system that can be fueled either from the water from rain or from the water from the well or some combination. And I think that that will be really um, um, a great way to irrigate this whole, this whole area in here. So that's my plan. I got lots of plans, um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's coming uh, coming up. We started uh, this project, not kidding, uh, like three years ago in design, and we applied for a grant from the USDA. Uh, they support uh, uh, certain kinds of um, improvements to uh, regenerative farms. Well, they don't use the word, but that's uh, it's from the NRCS, the uh, Natural uh, Natural Conservation Service. Not, not NRCS, Nat, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and uh, so they gave us a grant, uh, you know, it's a very small grant relative to, in percentage terms, to the cost of actually doing it all. But I wanted to uh, get them involved and they come out and they give me advice and they uh, are documenting everything that we're doing. And so it helps tell the story uh, to other farmers um, about what you can do. So this is our high tunnel. Uh, let's walk over here. We're going to go through the, uh, watch these uh, posts here.